I could call the meeting to order. Um, May 8th, 2023, workshop, the Greenville City Council to order. I am their pro tem and I will be presiding over the workshop. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Yes, ma'am. Mayor Connolly, and he has let us know that he will not be able to attend this evening. Mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Here. Council Member Daniels. Present. Council Member Blackburn. Present. Council Member Smiley. Council Member Robinson. Council Member Bell. Here. All right, Mayor Pro Tem, we have a quorum. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. uh, approval of the agenda. Mayor, Mayor Pertem, we have no changes to the agenda. Okay. Move to the move to approve the agenda as originally proposed. Second. Mm -hmm. okay. Motion's been made by Councilmember Smiley. Do you need a second? A second. Well, I mean, Bill. All right, second. Been made by Councilmember Bell. We just need a vote of the council. All those in favor? All those in favor. Oh, I'm Aye. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I was reading. <laughs> Trying to get ready for the next one. Trying to get ready. Okay. Um. All those opposed? All right. Motion passes. Uh, five zero. Okay. Um. Hang on a second. Your name. And then yes. I'll just take the first item. Okay. Mayor so, Madam, so the first Madam, item is C. Madam. Madam. Manager. Lots of M's there. The first item this evening is a uh, presentation on a charter amendment on city council terms, and I'll turn that over to City Attorney McGirt. Thank you, Madam Manager. <laughs> uh, greetings, Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. Um, I've been uh, asked to give um, a brief presentation on charter amendments regarding uh, city council terms. Um, and uh, this was requested by council member daniels so I'll give her her credit for that so request okay um so let's start off with pop quiz uh the form of government for the city of greenville regarding terms of office for mayor and council members is found in what law uh, the options are federal law uh, north carolina general statute 160a which is the main statute for cities but now you have 160D as well, or is this, or is it the the uh, city's charter, the Greenville City's charter? What do y'all think? It's got to be B. B. I'm going to say C based oh. upon the name of your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> the C is it? No, but B B was a good choice. If we didn't have a charter, we would have to default to to, yeah. to B state law. Uh, so legal authority for terms of office for the mayor and council members comes from the city's charter. Uh, the charter is a body of local acts currently enforced to a particular city and any amendments. So cities are created by, by the uh, General Assembly of typically passing a charter for the city. Uh, now Greenville's charter provides that the mayor and the council members serve two-year terms. They're not staggered, um, and so everybody's up for election at the same time. Now there are two ways to amend the charter. Either you, the council would have to adopt a local act and that means you have to go to the General Assembly, you would uh, pass that request and give it to the Pitt County local delegation, and they would run that bill at the General Assembly. Or the other uh, way to do it is adoption of a local ordinance. Uh, it's a kind of a convoluted process, takes three meetings, and it could also be subject to a referendum if the voters press for a referendum. Um, so method one, amend, amendment uh, of a charter by the General Assembly. So the council during an open meeting would approve the request to amend the charter and you would have to define that request. For instance, the council may say, well, hey, we've had, uh, we have elections for two years for the mayor and the council, everybody's up at the same time. We want to change that to four year terms and we want them to be staggered. So you'll have half of the council members up uh, different, during different cycles. So everybody won't be up for election at the same time. Um, so you have to define the request. You have to present that request. You have to approve it. You have to submit that request to the Pitt County local delegation, which are the two representatives here in Pitt County and also your state senator here in Pitt County to run the bill. Um, and the local delegation would seek to have the charter provision adopted and it would have to pass both chambers to become law. So that's the first method. The second method is state law allows uh, certain modifications to the charter by ordinance. Uh, and it's set forth in General Statute 160A-101. Any change to the city charter affecting election of city officers has to be finally adopted and approved at least 90 days before the election. And it is, this could actually happen in like three consecutive meetings. 
Um, council would have to adopt a resolution of intent to amend the charter. Uh, then you would have to, the city would have to publish notice of a public hearing. You'd have to hold a public hearing at your second meeting uh, within 45 days of that resolution. Uh, after that public hearing is held, you'd have to publish notice uh, within 10 days um, of, of the council uh, hearing to adopt an ordinance. And if you adopt that ordinance, um, it would become law. Now, you could also make that ordinance subject to a referendum of the voters. Um, or the voters, at that last bullet point, the voters could request a referendum. After that ordinance is adopted by council, you have, we have to publish notice in the paper, and it, within, 10, within 30 days, the public could say, hey, we want to have a referendum on this change to the charter. Um, How many signatures would be required? That's a good question. It would have to take uh, 5,000 signatures or 10% of the registered voters, uh, whichever is less. Yep. Um, so in, term, in, in terms of term links for the 20 largest cities in North Carolina, and I think Greenville would fall like around number 12, in terms of cities where mayors have four-year terms, eight of the 20 largest cities in, in the state, the mayor has uh, a four-year term. Uh, in 12 of the largest cities, and we fall there, Greenville, the mayor has a two-year term. Re regarding council members, um, in terms of cities with four-year terms, 13 of the 20 largest cities have four-year terms and uh, two-year terms for the other seven cities, and the city of Greenville will fall within the seven cities regarding uh, council terms, which are two years. Um, in terms of if you, if you wanted to run a bill like this at the General Assembly, Bethel uh, did this in 2020, and they just had flat terms, four years, everybody's up at the same time, and that was passed in 2020. Um, some, I think the, the, the board of, uh, the director of the Board of, of Elections said they're not gonna have an election this coming year. Um, because of this change. Aiden, they obtained a local act in 2013 uh, where they have four-year staggered terms. So every two years, half of the uh, council is up in Aiden. So again, I hope I delivered. I promised on a short presentation. Uh, want to shout out to Ms. Alexander for helping with this presentation and here to answer any questions. I don't have a question. Um, I don't have a question, but I'd like to thank you for um, putting this presentation together. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as you stated, it was a request that um, I felt would be beneficial um, economically for the city of Greenville, and then having our surrounding cities, um, not just Aiden and Bethel, um, but Winterville, um, Kinston, um, all those cities are four-year terms. And so <clears throat> st staggered is, is something that I would like to see. Um, and again, just thank you um, for putting that presentation together. Thank you. Yeah. And one other thing about staggered terms is the kind of um, convoluted way that this works. But if you do staggered terms, one group of the council members are just going to have a two-year term for the, for the first year of the election, and the other group would have a four-year election. And after that, it would run four years. Uh, just a little chart there. But you can't make them staggered without somebody being punished a little bit. Well, at least somebody would have a, a shorter term than other council members, and they, that, would, that decision would have to be made. So, and so, and we're not looking for this to happen for this November, this term. It would be I pretty tight if y'all want y'all. It's your decision. I want that, but I want that clear. Yeah, you know, it's exactly. Yeah. Okay. Remember, here you're here, Ms. Councilmember Daniels, said she's not asking for this for 2023. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Just to be clear, you think a longer term is a benefit? I have no recommendation. Oh, you said, once someone gets punished, and you're saying giving the guy the two-year term is a punishment. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I'll stand you. Out that. I got you. I got you. I got you. Okay, well, thank you so much. Are they, are they, are they, they are cities that, that don't stack everybody in mind? Yeah. Right. Like yep. Charlotte. I guess. Yep. And I, can, I have a like chart. said Bethel for four years. Yeah. It, was it Bethel or Aiden? I'm sorry. Bethel, Bethel has Bethel. 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 I have a chart, too, that shows that four more on the cities. On Charlotte, everybody runs at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. So, so Aiden, um, they own the two-year terms, too. Well, they are. Mm -hmm. However, I think that it has been a subject of much discussion in Charlotte mm -hmm. about yeah. conversion and converting. Yeah, Charlotte, they're proud to see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, is that a choice that the council can choose? I, mean, I, I think it's the council's four years, or I don't. That's what he was talking about. We would have to get. Uh, we can either 
have three or four meetings about it ourselves, or we can have the state. Mm -hmm. We can ask the general assembly to make a change. There's two ways to, to do that. Um, okay. If you all do it by ordinance, it's definitely your choice. If you take it to the general assembly, the general assembly has power over the city, so they, they may take your choice and they may follow your choice, or they could change your choice. Okay. See, I don't want to wait past this next election to put this in place. Yes. That's, that, that would put us, what, three like years 25. out from this change? Two, maybe. Two and a half, yeah. 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 Some of us might not be here at that point. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, and, 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 and I think, well, and I think, too, we don't want to give the um, assumption that we're doing it for ourselves and assuming that we, you know, we just, I think it's wise for even future councils as we go forward. Yeah, well, I think... Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm getting at is we know for certain there will be at least one new council member next time with Correct. Rick mm -hmm. uh, retiring, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. um, we're taking a sabbatical. Escaping. Uh, but so, you know, if the intent of this, like we've talked about, is to, you know, make it so that new council members have more time to get adjusted and learn before they have to run again, then it would make sense in my mind to go ahead and move this thing along and get it going. Because, you know, the first year almost, you're doing orientations, learning the facilities, learning about the budget process. There's a lot of change that takes place, um, and a lot of learning that takes place. So in my mind, if we know for sure we've got at least one new member coming on, it might be smart to go ahead and enact this. But, but I, and, and I, two cents. Go ahead. I, I see when you're ready. And another thing, too, um, I if I could have running, not going to do every two years, but that's a lot of work. I mean, for us. Now, I don't mind running, but it is a lot of work and it requires a lot of your supporters that, you know, help you during the election. Here they go, they're running every two years, and um, maybe even could have done four. Um, I think if we're going to go for it, we need to go for it as, as that because not as a four or not as a two year term, but for the four, because we may be rejected anyway and we have to go back and do something different. Um, I think that we need to try because running an election every two years and even if it's going to be staggered, it's still going to be you got to run an election every You're running for election all the time and then you may get someone on um, that stays on the council um, and only two years, so and not finish the four. Mm -hmm. You may get somebody to quit. You know, I've been here a long time. I've seen a lot of things happen, <laughs> but um, you know, that's that's my opinion because I think that if you're going to go for it, I'd like to know what Charlotte is doing, City Manager. We can find that out. It's my understanding they have two year terms where there's been discussion mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I talked to any movement. I talked to Councilmember uh, Mitchell at yeah. the meeting, at um, at the league meeting, and he was telling me that um, that they wanted to go all uh, four because the same reason I said you run it. Um, it's okay for everybody to run at the same time, but it's even harder if you come on and uh, do two years and then you. Can't run another year. You understand what I'm saying? So you're saying you don't want this to stagger? I don't think staggering is a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing. I think that it really keeps the manager and everybody trying to learn new people, and um, everybody's different. Everybody got mind their own, and it just keeps the manager and other staff members working really hard trying to keep things. Going. Okay, that's it. All right. Yes. Uh, uh, first of all, I actually strongly agree with Councilmember Glover about not staggering whatever we do. And I just want to say thank you to Councilmember Daniels for bringing this forward and to everyone for sharing your responses. I spent a lot of time thinking about this and looking into this. And um, call me a policy wonk. All you MPA folks will know what I'm talking about. But I went back to the Federalist Papers on this one because this is a really important issue in government. Elections how often, staggered, what kind of terms. And so um, I'm not always a fan of James Madison, but I think he really summed up how I feel about this. 
he says, it was in Federalist number, 20, number 52, he says, it is essential to liberty that the government in general should have a common interest with the people. So it is particularly essential that the branch under consideration should have an immediate dependence on and an intimate sympathy with the people. Frequent elections, therefore, are key to this intimate sympathy. And he goes on to talk about that, but um, he, he concludes by saying that the liberties of the people can never be in danger from biennial elections. And that is really where I come down. As much as I agree with Councilmember Glover that elections take a lot of energy and we, we ask a lot of our supporters to come out, I, I, be, I believe to my core that frequent elections are important for a local government. I also believe that the ability to completely change the council by not having staggered terms is also important. I believe that ultimately we're, we work for the people of Greenville, and to, to, to the way I see that, since we work for the people of Greenville, we need to go to them frequently, and we need to go to them in, in, in our entirety. So that's, that's where I fall on this. I would, I would support keeping our two-year terms as they are and not having any elections staggered. Yeah. My last comment is to the extent the council wants to do this soon, um, there's a deadline to submit a legislation to the General Assembly and talk about state lobbyists. I'm not sure if there's even time to go the General Assembly route. Remember, as the chart said, there's a statute, that second bullet point. The, um, the ordinance has to go into effect at least 90 days before the election, so you got a tight, tightness there as well. So I just wanted to, to the extent somebody wants to jump on this, it, it may, I guess be, that was my question may be you. difficult. So Should we decide to move forward? Would you prefer hearing from the people or going to legislation? I'm going to the House. As, as much as I respect everybody who does support this, I would not be able to support it under either of the avenues. Okay. But I, think, I think her question was more if it seems it's going to move forward, which way, right? Correct. Which, uh -huh. way, which way would you rather see it? At that point, I would say it would be the will of the council. Oh. Um, well, with all due respect to the Federalist, um, he was writing about 200 years ago about federal elections for people who lived, a, you know, multi, many days' ride from uh, their hometown. Uh, I think people who live right next to their neighbors probably um, um, are pretty are probably insulated from Dr. from Mr. Madison's concerns. The uh, but the biggest, in my opinion, it's not about what's convenient for members of council, right? Um, it's about what's in the best interest of the citizens. The challenge is, is that campaigns are all about what you disagree about, right? It makes no there's very little point in standing up next to your opponent and saying, we agree on everything, right? Even if you agree on, on almost everything, you still have to talk about the things you disagree about. Otherwise, there's no decision to be made. Governing is about figuring out the things you do agree about. So the biggest advantage to this would be that you, you, you would extend the length of time where you're talking about what you agree on and you'd minimizing you minimize to some extent the the percentage of time you're focused on your disagreements because mm -hmm. i think all of us around the table know it's almost impossible to govern on something everybody disagrees about right mm -hmm. unless if we want to pass something we all have to find some way of moving forward that we generally speaking agree on elections are you know not periods of time where you do that so the best argument for this you know is that it would be in the citizens interest not in a member of council's interest uh, and the reason would be was that the citizens would get more time during which their leaders were focused on, you know, finding areas of consensus and agreement that were in the that were in the citizens' best interest, and less time fighting amongst each other, you know, in order to get their jobs back. I say that as somebody who's already said I'm not planning on running again. So it's um, this is not about you know me getting a longer term anywhere. This is I've and I've said this many times in many forums. I really think that. Um, a longer term would be advantageous to the government of the city. At that point, we, we have a, a real question of how to hold the council accountable. With two-year terms and with the council coming up in its entirety, um, again, regardless of your dismissing or minimizing Mr. Madison's concerns, 
I believe what he said is true. This frequent having to go to the people. And yes, things you disagree on, that's how you make policy. You don't make policy by like-minded people sitting in a room. You make policy by getting out amongst the public and the churn of um, debate and discussion with all its sharp edges. That's how you get good public policy. That's me. Okay. Any other discussion? Thank you. Thank That's you. It. Are you looking for direction? Uh, you're looking for direction, Mr. Attorney? No. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. That's pretty straight. So, yeah. All right. All right. So, our next item, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, is an update from Mr. Phillips regarding various revisions to the city code. So talking a little bit about the uh, revisions to city code, we're going to be talking about some various revisions to city code. First, we have to talk a little bit about the old law, the way things were done before we were getting ready to talk about Senate Bill 300. Under the old law, there was the general rule that unless council provided otherwise, a violation of a city ordinance is a class three misdemeanor by default. Um, under uh, or an infraction under four, uh, North Carolina General Statute 14-4. So the two statutes at issue that address that are 168-175 and 14-4, enforcement of ordinances and violation of local ordinances misdemeanor. So it says new current law, but this took place in 2021. So a Senate bill uh, or session law 2021-138 uh, more commonly known and referred to as Senate Bill 300. But it made changes to North Carolina General Statute 175 and 14-4 to completely decriminalize all ordinances in the state of North Carolina under certain circumstances and creating a new general rule. So the new general rule, the new default rule is as follows, except for the types of ordinances listed in 168-175B1, which we'll talk about that in just a second. A violation of a city ordinance may be a misdemeanor or infraction as provided by 14-4 only if the city specifies such in the ordinance. So under that same Senate Bill 300, there were some stipulations to that. Number one, it required if uh, the city council or governing body was going to add a uh, criminal sanction, it would have to have two readings. Um, and then number two, it listed out, that was that B1 section that I said to look, look out for in just a second. It specified 10 types of ordinances that may not be uh, imposed uh, a criminal penalty, no, have no imposition of a criminal penalty. And those are listed there, local planning and development regulation, except those related to unsafe buildings, stream clearing programs, regulating and licensing businesses and trades, outdoor advertising, solar collector, cisterns and rain barrels, building setback lines, uh, curb cut regulations, and trees. None of those can have criminal penalties under uh, Senate Bill 300. So corrective action was needed by the city of Greenville, just like every other city in the state of North Carolina and counties. Uh, number one, to remove criminal penalties from ordinances that can no longer be enforced criminally. Number two, to identify those specific ordinances in which a criminal penalty is requested and applying criminal penalties to those specific section. So I call this kind of ordinance surgery, if you will, that we had to go back and look at our ordinances to address this. Now, one of the things that Senate Bill 300 did not change was this section of 168-175 that said that a city shall have the power to impose fines and penalties for violation of its ordinances and may secure injunctions and abatement orders to further ensure compliance with its ordinances as provided in the section. So that part did not change. So again, we're talking a little bit about this ordinance surgery to address those two issues, but while we are there and we have the ordinance patient on the table, we're gonna be looking at five different uh, things here to address. Number one, to bring the city code provisions into better compliance. Number two, to standardize both criminal and civil penalties under our uh, code. Number three, to address appeal provisions. Number four, to clean up certain ordinances. In other words, re uh, reword certain ordinances, move some to certain chapters. In other words, think of this as different books. This book belongs on a different shelf, that type of thing. 
Number five, repeal those preempted or otherwise not needed. So some of the ordinances, as you can well imagine, haven't been updated in quite a while, so we tried to look at that. So number one, bringing city code provisions into better compliance. You've already done some of that already by looking at, for example, uh, Part 2, Title 12, the animal ordinance. Um, we did that, what, last year or year before last. So that has been done already. Number two, revision of Part 10, Title, uh, Part 2, Title 10, Chapter 2, where, and that proposed revision is in your packet. That is completely repealing and rewriting Chapter 2 of Title 10 to better address traffic parking regulations as proposed. Number, three, uh, number two, to standardize both criminal and civil penalties. Some examples that you'll, you'll see, and we had this in the animal uh, provision as well, for those criminal penalties, uh, make those a class three misdemeanor and criminal penalty of not less than $100 and not more than $500, bless you. Civil penalty, first violation, $100 ticket, second violation, $250, and then third violation, $500, to kind of uh, standardize that throughout the code. Number three, to address appeal provisions. There is a default appeal provision in Title I, uh, Chapter 1, Section 20, uh, and it basically says for any appeal, any appeal that's not specifically addressed in the ordinance, that is the default appeal for any civil penalties. So one of the things that we are looking at is updating that language. We're also looking at, um, you know, you had enacted a rewrite of City Code 12-2-6. That's in the proposal also. That's talking about the appeal board with the animals. Uh, the, under the animal ordinance, we're trying to look at you know, the veterinarian issue, and so we're looking at revising that to make sure that we have a robust appeal board that we can actually seat and, and hear these uh, appeals. Number two, a revision of Title 10. Again, that is a complete rewrite and to add an appeal board to that as well. And then number three, to refer to default appeal procedure under that 1120 process, which we talked about just a second ago. Number four, to clean up ordinances or to reword, move, uh, reword, move or uh, move to other chapters. So, for example, we were talking a little bit about the uh, appeal board. And so this is the proposed language for the appeal board that it would, instead of uh, what it currently says, then to say the ap appeal board shall be constituted of three city employees who shall be authorized to hear and decide appeals in accordance with this section. One member shall be the chief of police or designee from the police department. The remaining two members shall be either the city manager and a designee or two designees selected by the city manager. There shall be, shall be an alternate member selected by the city manager to serve on the appeal board in the event of a conflict, and the APS supervisor may not serve on the appeal board. So again, the APS supervisor would be the one um, actually making the decisions appealed, uh, so they would not, he or she would not be able to serve on the board. Can I ask a question about sure. this? Sure. Not to get too much in the weeds on This hasn't been, hasn't come to us yet, has it? It is a, the language is proposed in a draft form at this stage. It has not gone to uh, the governing, you know, to you for adoption yet. Because having worked on those animal protective services ordinances, um, even before I got on council, one of the things that, that was nice about the appeal board is that it did have that outside community member. And again, I know that's not the topic of our discussion today. It, it concerns me a bit if, if it would be like three members of the city staff. I think I, I, I think that's something that I hope we'll look at maybe more closely. And I know we, we looked for a vet and couldn't see a vet on that appeal board, so I know that's an issue. But when that does come before us, maybe we can talk more about it then. Sounds good. All right, number two, to move and rework current 12-1-8. Uh, so for example, uh, motorized vehicles on the greenways, that's actually found in Title 12 as opposed to Title 10, which would be transportation and traffic. So it seems like the better fit to put that book on the shelf would be to move it over to Title 10. So that's what we're looking to do there uh, as a proposal. Number five is to repeal those uh, ordinances that are preempted or otherwise not needed. So for example, that we have an ordinance regulating bicycle helmets. It's already preempted by state law, and so it's not needed in our city code. Likewise, as an example, uh, under Title VI, which is the public works, 
Uh, it gives the power of arrest to the public works director. So we're actually asking that that would be repealed also uh, under that. <laughs> so, so the next steps. Uh, next steps, the proposed ordinance revisions will need to come back to city council and you have a draft in front of you of what is proposed uh, currently. Anybody have questions for Mr. Phillips? I do. Um, so just looking at this from the 30,000 foot view, it sounds like the General Assembly went through and just wholesale said no more, you cannot criminalize unless you go through specifically. And, and, and furthermore, there's some things that you can't criminalize at all. That's correct, yes. <clears throat> So we're going back and having to redo and add criminal penalties where we think is appropriate, but otherwise they've all been removed. Well, they've been removed, but the ordinances, some of those ordinances still say it shall be a criminal penalty. So you, for those that you can't have a criminal penalty, you've actually got to go back, take that language out. And while we're at it, if we are going to recriminalize those, we need to add that back in and then standardize it. So it sounds like there's only 10 areas where we cannot have criminal penalties. And they look pretty innocuous. Although I will say, if somebody goes through and mutilates and devastates multiple trees in our city, would they not face, Chief, some kind of criminal penalty at some point? They may face a criminal penalty that's otherwise captured in, for example, the North Carolina General uh, Statutes. So there may be some criminal penalties in Chapter 14 of the North Carolina General Statutes, and there may be some civil pr uh, provisions and civil penalties that council can look at as far as application for that for trees to increase civil penalties uh, for that as well. I'm just thinking there are criminal acts that could take place involving trees. <coughs> that, that's correct. It's <coughs> devastating vandalism of our heritage trees. Excuse me, so but other than those then, I'm just, um, I'm just um, I guess trying to get, get my head around what we're doing here, we're going back, we're adding criminal penalties where we can. Do you see this as, is it, is, do, are we at risk of not having the kind of enforcement ability we need with our ordinances because of uh, a House bill or Senate bill or Bill 300? In other words, these changes, have they reduced our ability to enforce our own laws? Um, I, I don't believe so. I mean, I think this is something that we, we are addressing and we're trying to be very um, thoughtful and thorough in the process. And so I think you know staff has looked at that and, and I think we're trying to, to get to, to the point that we have this corrected in the best way. So even though criminal penalties were sort of wholesale removed, we're able to go back to use your surgery reference from earlier. We're able to sort of surgically, where we believe criminal penalties are needed, we can reinsert them. We just have to do it Ordinate, one ordinance at a time. That's right, and and you've done that in some some of your ordinances already that you passed. For example, with the with uh, the animals also discharging a weapon in the city. That was one of the early ones that was done a, a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. no, man. Thank you. Um, I, the third item on tonight's um, workshop agenda is a review of the town common and bulkhead and esplanade replacement and the conceptual design. I'm going to turn it over to Mark Nottingham who will introduce our guests. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So this presentation um, is going to showcase two designs to develop for the town common bulkhead replacement. Uh, we're here today because of a structural assessment done on the bulkhead last year. Uh, it really showed the need for this project. Um, this is task order uh, number one that uh, developed these design concepts. And at the conclusion of the presentation, uh, we'll ask for council's uh, direction on a preferred design concept. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Mark Corello. Uh, he's with Moffat and Nickel on the design team. And Sharon Rue is also here from the East Group, the one through the designs. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mayor Potem, council members. As Mark said, we're here today really to have an opportunity to talk about uh, this opportunity to really reimagine re resilience along uh, Town Common. You know, we have a shoreline edge that is done over its 55 plus years uh, way of protecting the park and the infrastructure from the, the effects of the Tar River uh, during various flooding events. But 
with that opportunity, it's also become a kind of a boundary line with the water and how people approach the water. And so we want to talk about how we can kind of balance both both efforts, still protect the park during flooding events, but at the same time improving access to the water. So each of these concepts takes a, a variation of how that uh, can be approached. So just a little bit of a, a, a kind of step back from what uh, we were talking about in terms of the condition of the bulkhead. The bulkhead was built in 1967, and so we're over 55 plus years now. And, um, and it's slowly been deteriorating <laughs> over the last um, good 20, 25 years. Uh, Moffa Nickel did a um, uh, inspection back in May of 2004, and then we followed it up last year in 2022. And what we're seeing basically is a degradation of the steel. You know, the steel corrodes in water over periods of time, and we're just losing that thickness of steel. So what, what we're seeing now is that the service life of the, of the bulkhead is coming to its end. And so what that means to that is that if you continue to, if this remains as a structure, the repair costs are continuing to be escalated higher and higher such that you get to the point where replacement is, is more economical than you are um, just repairing it over an extended period of time. Which one of y'all climbed that ladder? <laughs> uh, uh, I did not, so I'll tell you that. Um, but just to give you a good reference and a good point, that is... Uh, uh, general water that is 15 feet so the variation with the bulkhead from the top of bulkhead down to water depending on where we are is between 15 and 20 feet so it is a significant distance between the water so when we talk about access now you have a sense of how far you may be from the water um, so the, the objectives as we were talking about again we want to maintain flood protection we want to improve access to the water those are two critical things that we wanted to do but we also want to take this opportunity to look at how we can enhance the experience along that edge um, and then also create other opportunities for circulation and, and pathways within the, the near shore edge of that. So we'll talk about that a little bit. We always want to look about how we can minimize construction costs. And so we'll, we'll, our objectives in looking at these alternatives take that into consideration. Uh, environmental enhancements, um, we want something that is also some, an edge that can react to water, can be resilient, but it also provides some type of habitat uh, en enhancement. So that's a key here. And of course, from a, from a city perspective, we always want something that is, minimizes maintenance, and especially during a, a post-flood cleanup event. And so those were also our key elements in our thought process. So. Maybe you mentioned this, but is there some design out design consideration that look if we ever have to do something with this thing, it's not like not monumental, right? I mean, one of the challenges here is that what's created kind of the con the problem along the way is there's nothing to be done unless you like bite off the whole chunk, right? And I was, what if we put it back, you know, yeah. conceivably could be something that was a little more modular or granular or could be addressed you know in smaller pieces i don't know if that's a possibility i'm just saying yeah, well, is that something that's, it, that's thought that's figured into your thought process sure i mean i think a piece of it there's implementation so there's phasing right how, how best to phase it from a uh, from a budgetary because it is a quarter mile worth of shoreline so it is a fairly large piece of uh, element and then, you know, in the future, how to build those elements in such that you could kind of mix and match or play again. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, we're kind of balancing longevity uh, I mean, of materials and design because what we placed in, we want to have a design that is equivalent to where it was. So we want, our goal is 50 plus years. And so uh, just like this bulkhead is, you know, at age 55. So it, it met its 50 plus year design life as well. And so when we look at that balance. At the end of that design life. Yeah. Be nice if it wasn't, you know, something that it all's got to, you know, that all either fails at once or yep. has to be replaced at once. Right. right. No, I think, that, and we'll kind of craft in one of the all terms how we've looked at different shoreline types and how that can work to that to that question. So the first one I want to maybe in in a a more general term is what we call replacement in kind. So this is you know you have a bulkhead there today. This is replacing it, but with an understanding that we still want to include some of those access uh, elements into the into the system. So there's posters in the back as well. So if you have opportunities after after the workshop and before your your general meeting um, to take a look at them, but just kind of reflective right here. Um, the blue outline generally is the area we're working within, 
right now. And so obviously there's some pieces where the renderings kind of meld in, and, but this our general area is really this, this outline. But starting from Green Street and walking down, you can see the bulkhead is generally in the same alignment. It's hard to see, but it's a black line, but it more or less is in where it is today. It's out in front. We don't, repl we don't take out the old bulkhead. We put a new one in front. Um, a fairly standard regulatory process, so it's not something that's challenging to do, and it's less expensive than trying to rip out a bulkhead, which means you have to dig everything out from behind it and then put a new one in. So that's that's a challenging. So the more straightforward process, put it in front by a couple inches, and then and then that creates that seamless transition. But walking from Green Street heading to the east, um, you know, we've tried to preserve a lot of the tree canopy that makes the, the, the west side special. We tried to integrate a path into that, into that. And then as you kind of walk out, we do have an overlook area opportunity that's over the bulk, bulkhead. So again, we're trying to create this access uh, and a little bit better feeling of being on the water. So something that we don't see today. And then as you progress further down to the east, uh, again, we, and that's, the Esplanade is a key feature that's been with the, with the park for a long time, and so we wanted to maintain that Esplanade, that, you know, right against the water where you can look down and see it. So that is still there today, but we've also created a secondary circular path and circulation for those that want to come and kind of come in and out of that Esplanade feature, but also enjoy the amenities of the park. There's a little bit better connection if you're down there today, you know there's a there's a little retaining wall between the Esplanade and the park that is hard to make the jump up. So again, we're trying to look at ways to again create that uh, interaction. We also see opportunities, and I think this is if I don't do this right here, if this is a red button or not. Um, also opportunities in the middle of the park to create some seating areas that are against the water. Again, trying to to create that the interface as we move uh, as we progress. As we go further east from the amphitheater as it sits today, it's very similar to what we see today. Some of that is because the amphitheater is fairly close to the bulkhead, so we don't have a lot of opportunity to start putting changes into the design. But as we finally get to the east side of it, this is where we see giving the same alignment, but then working in at the far east side a way of getting down to the water. And so here is a mixture of a kind of a, uh, I'll call it a back and forth zigzag um, walkway. Why we do that? Because we have accessibility requirements. So we want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to get to the water as we come down in the elevation. So you kind of see that meander. But there we integrate in a little bit, and I'll show you uh, here maybe in the next couple sections. We start to integrate um, some steps and some stairs. This is a little bit further in the middle of the park where we're talking about some of the terrace seating. Again, the bulkhead is, is over the new one. You can see it's in front of the old one. Uh, we have a little step off now where the railing is, so you're not ex right at the edge of the rail. The, the bulkhead's a little bit in front of that now. Um, and then you have this transition where you have some terracing, and then of course, then there's opportunities for some environmental enhance enhancements with rain gardens and some other stormwater improvements that may get integrated in. And then uh, this gives you a real sense of, you know, we do have a floating dock. We would do want to get that public uh, from the water embracing. And so from people coming in the water, you have kayakers, you got little John boats or someone else um, using the river, that they can come in and access the park from the water. Right now, that's, that's a challenge unless you're on the far east side at the boat ramp. And so we try to integrate that into the, into the process. And then here is section three, which is right adjacent to the boat. This is what we're talking about. We still have a long bulkhead, but then we try to integrate a little bit of stair stepping right at the end. And this is where you kind of walk down that corner edge, and then you walk into this terrace seating area. So you're right at the, at the edge. So this is our first concept in saying, this is replacement in kind, but we're still giving you an opportunity to get to the water. Before you go to that next concept, how many, yes. feet, how many feet is that floating dock? That floating dock is uh, more or less, probably uh, give or take, about uh, 100 to 120 feet, it's something 100, like that. About 150 feet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it depends. That's not uh, final uh, list. But our goal is, you know, five to six, up to maybe 10 boats, depending on sizing. And would that design only allow docking on the outside? Yeah, as, as it currently sits, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, we would have the anchoring system on the on the um, bulkhead side, and then have that uh, thing. Again, we're also looking at how debris management moves, and and trying not to create areas of pockets and capture. Mm -hmm. So that was our idea to, to keep it closer to the bulkhead. And there may be some other debris. If this option goes in this location goes forward, then there's probably some other debris management options that we'll want to take into consideration to deflect some of that, so it doesn't hit the dock. 
Okay. In, in this slide where you've got the people out, I guess, mm -hmm. on the far end of the bulkhead. Sure. So that's a locked-in position. That doesn't rise and go. So how far is that up off the river? Yeah, so the idea is we step it in um, and, and fashion. So the, the lowest one is probably around, and this will get, obviously, if this is an option, gets fine-tuned with the frequency of the of flooding and how often. But it's roughly around uh, plus five to plus six above the river, so you're about five feet off. Against the high water mark. What's that? Against the high water no, mark. No, against the high water mark. Right? So you're asking, will this get flooded? Is it maybe the question? I'm looking at. Yeah, so you would have capture yeah. for logs right. and debris and stuff. When the water comes back down, you're going to be winding up yeah. that stuff up if it's not right. so high. Right, so you're at a higher position here. This is your standard position right. as it stands today. And then this area at the end, yeah, you will see some inundation. And so we design it such that it can take that inundation and then have minor cleanup because, again, that's our opportunity to try to get down to the water. So the docks that are floating, you just have a dock where you can come and dock and step out of your boat or whatever, but not access to the upper level? No, it does. So I wish I had a pointer here. Maybe I don't understand how it works. But there is a gangway from that dock to this this terraced area at the okay. lower end, and then okay. from there you walk up to that zigzag basically into the parking lot. And yeah. So this would be the far east end of the... This is really park. centralized to the far east end okay. of the park. Correct. Thank you. So I'll call concept B uh, a little bit different. That was replacement of kind A. This one's called B is embracing the river. So we take a little bit more opportunity to the work uh, access to it. And so similarities from, I'll say, the red line number one to the uh, west as it is in uh, concept A. So they're both the same. There is a bulkhead in kind replacement from, you know, from Green Street down to the middle of the park. Uh, again, same opportunities to improve access along that, that corridor um, and seating areas and circulation paths and esplanade. All that stays the same as it is today. What well, we see, the real change is coming to the east of the Esplanade. So here's where we take in an opportunity to really start to cut back the bulkhead. So now this is where we're doing a system where we have much lower bulkhead, and now we're looking at sloped and terraced systems moving forward this way. So similar to maybe a little bit of the east, where we saw at the end of concept A, but enlarging that opportunity, bringing some environmental enhancements and some vegetative areas, again, trying to maybe get a little less structure, um, hardened surfaces that is today, um, but still providing access uh, through the process. So I'll walk through the sections here, and I've gone concept A on the top, so you can kind of get, the, they're very similar sections and locations. So you can see section A, um, you're up at, you know, you're up for you have plus 15, plus 16, and then, the, and then there's that floating dock down at water level. And so you can see that, that elevation difference. And so, with concept B, we have a bulkhead still, uh, a little bit higher elevation, around plus eight or so. Um, with, a, with a timber boardwalk that gets you right out to the edge, the floating dock is still uh, riverward of that. And then we have that terrace seating again, and then an opportunity uh, of a, a connecting boardwalk between different sections, a little bit higher up. And then, of course, then back up to the, uh, the most uh, elevated level, which is where the park is today. So we're getting in a transition as we go, again, incorporating different environments, all accessible. Um, and so that's the key here, again, allowing people to experience. Obviously, if there's different river levels. It doesn't also preclude um, access to those that near water because we're adjusting for different heights. Again, everything designed such that it's maintained during inundation periods, and so that's a key. Again, we, we don't want to, one of the key things we mentioned is trying to minimize maintenance, still balancing that access. Again, concept uh, five. Again, moving a little bit further east, and so you can see what we're talking about that on A, where we were right at the far end by the parking lot, where we had that kind of step down right at that localized location. B takes it a little bit further, uh, cuts back the bulkhead more. We have some vegetative stabilization and environment. Um, we have a boardwalk that's elevated again. Um, again, trying to walk this way and meander its way through that vegetation. And again, the educational opportunities that come with that. And then at the end, we have the upland retaining wall. Um, again, still providing the, the overall protection to the, to the park infrastructure as it stands today. Just a different way of imagining and envisioning that access to the water and, and, and providing those educational and uh, um, different environments in which to learn uh, for the citizens and uh, visitors alike. 
And this, so this is kind of a thought process. This is concept B at the end. So maybe in, in rendering perspective, gives it a little bit easier understanding. And we thanks to Sharon on this. Um, but you really get a sense of how how all this works. There's the floating dock. There's the gangway. I think someone asked earlier. Um, so you can see how that comes down to the dock, but how that comes back up. And then we we have this meandering, uh, accessible path that moves in there. Terrace seating. Uh, vegetation transitions. Of course, there's always stairs for those that want to use them. And then the upper tier of the park as it stands today um, yeah, is still maintained. So again, all, all opportunities uh, for uh, between um, A and B, one B is a little bit more um, uh, aggressive in, in trying to create that different environment. Just uh, understanding, we did do a, a public outreach. The city was pro very proactive on this. Um, you can see the posters in the background. We had some presentation boards as well, um, brochures, and we did have a project web page as well. A um, couple of summaries, outreach events. Um, uh, last month, we had a meeting with uh, the Parks and Recs uh, uh, Committee. Uh, and their input, uh, we also had a virtual stakeholders meeting. That was with the, those the users of the park today to get their input into the changes that may be. Um, and then we were also trying to have an opportunity when they had the concert in the common, but um, as everyone knows, uh, the weather um, was uh, fortunate for that and it didn't work out. But we did take an online public survey that was up for 30 days. Uh, we were fortunate to get uh, good participation, 440 participants. We asked them two questions, try to keep it uh, focused into what we were looking at. Um, first question, which of the two you liked? The kind of replacement in kind and the, or the one that is embracing the water? And as you can see, uh, zoomed up is 77% really enjoyed concept B. They like that the ability to get to the water and have those water related things. It's really looking at it from, if you take a perspective, one of the comments was, were the town's done a the city's done a great job of of really enhancing how people look the park inwards. Those from the water looking this way. So this is an opportunity to really have that vision where people come up the river and they can really access it and see it. And it gives you some programming events, concerts in the park on water, something different that you may not have programmed in the past. Um, and then kind of the things, what features people like the most? And uh, not surprisingly, uh, walkways to water and terrace seating near the water were the, were the popularities. And again, kind of focusing back on concept B. So it was a good engagement process. We enjoyed the feedback. It helped to funnel some of these and, and focus our, our uh, vision as we went forward here. Can you hold for one second? Sure. Those green bars don't have anything next to them. What are those to? Yeah, you mean at 53%? Yeah, in the 40 to Yeah, Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, it, it, I think we might have one extra uh, one or thing in there. I'll, I'll follow up on and see what that, that the key was. But the 75% the, the, the and the 70% um, the were the two that were associated with um, uh, the terrace seating and the uh, uh, walkways. So, okay. Well, that's a good question. I'll follow up. And then I, I did the survey on my phone, seeing the renderings here on a 100 inch screen or whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, shows things a lot better. Do we have any breakdown on what percentage of folks completed the survey on a mobile device versus maybe a laptop or a desktop where they would have gotten a better picture of what we were discussing? A good question, but I'll, I'll, follow, I'll follow up on that, that question. I don't, I don't have that uh, in front of me right now. Okay. And was Concept B 150 foot boat dock as well? Or? Yeah, both of them have the same uh, water access, boating access per se. And, and I think there's, you know, we talk about it down there. The, the city has opportunities to look at uh, grand opportunities for that boating dock uh, because it is a transient facility. So okay. something to be considered. Okay. Thank you. It's great participation too in the. Yeah, we were really pleased with uh, and and uh, it, you know all the workshop meetings, the stakeholder meeting, everything was really good. It was, it was very very helpful. Any projects you've done that have components similar to this that we can go look at that are that are not in, in ready to start design and construction? Yeah, I'll, I'm trying to think of. That is a, a park that is in close proximity to to the city. Um, that's completed recently. Probably nothing in close proximity. I could give you some examples. Well, give me some examples, even if it's not close. We can go to get an eye idea of what some of this stuff might look like. 
Um, yeah, so I think if you, a couple of projects I worked on um, in Bulkhead, um, there's a good one where we did uh, a, a park in, um, in downtown Tampa on the river. Same same concepts, uh, same thought as Julian B. Lane Park. Same same thought process there where we had some terracing and some seating. If you want to look at some other topics with just terracing and some of that zigzag path, you can look at Georgetown Park up in Washington, D.C. That's going to be my next. Yeah, that's somewhere that, up there. Yeah, it'll be somewhere up there. And, 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 yeah, well, we're working on in Alexandria right now. We'll, uh, as we used to regress on something similar to that. Okay. That's in, in process. Well, we'll um, work and get a couple of mm -hmm. ideas and share it with the council Thank about you. some other locations. Yeah. We're happy to share that. Sure. And the idea about mobile, I heard mobile versus um, computer, and there was one more, and then the, the two green bars. So how much of the difference between option A and option B is, in your opinion, is cost driven? So it, really, it's surprisingly, so, you know, presumably, you can make, you know, we could do option B, you know, the, the changes in option B on the downstream side of the park could be applied to the upstream side of the park if you were have, a, have enough budget for it, right? I mean, there's no... So a couple of things I haven't touched on. So there's a couple of physical constraints in, in the park. There is a sanitary sewer line. So obviously from a preservation on the on the west side, obviously that could be. I'm sorry. There's a what? Sanitary sewer line, trunk line, sewer, sewer line. So yeah, that could that could change, or that could be an infrastructure, another infrastructure project that the city could embark to move that, and so that would give you that flexibility. There's also tree canopies. You know, there's there's always a balance of what you're going to remove, which is is there as preservation, um, and there is a fair amount of uh, cypress and other trees on on that western corridor. So you know, when we looked at it, we were trying to make some preservation thought processes there, and not just wholeheartedly rip everything out. But to answer your question, they both cost about the same. Oh, really? Yeah. So because the steel costs obviously with less steel, less weight. Less cost, so B having less uh, bulkheading um, is kind of that offsetting. Even though we're doing terracing and other elements, were you when when you're presented with the design, were you um, were you aware that that part, that that end of the park, the very far, the downstream end, the east end, is basically the only part of the park that was purchased at market. So I mean, we bought, we literally bought that mm -hmm. part, of that end of the park. Um, from a willing seller, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there was no condemnation agreement on hearing or anything along those lines. So we have a lot more flexibility about what we do there. Mm -hmm. Was that part at all? Were you familiar with those arrangements? And I, I wasn't, but I think as, as, the, as the design team looked at it, I mean, the elevations work better there too, and the transitions work better just because of the, of the parking lot too. It also greets, again, trying to balance and take advantage of what we have already and and I think those transitions made more sense to have that experience plus the view shed to be honest with you looking down river is best on is, is really best on that side because the bend in the river further down really sets that up as a, as a focal point so it kind of all crafted itself down to the to the east side now, and and with the, the, the considerations on the west you'll see we try to owe a little bit of that with that outlook and that overlook on the west side so you still have down river views or up river views um, but at the same time, we're not, you know, we're, we're balancing what we we had some constraints there. But no, we didn't know that. But uh, but okay. there was other bit, there are other things that crafted okay. into our strategy. Are there any other um, uh, okay? So you've listed the, the, the view shed and the elevation, and then there's, I guess, negative infrastructure at the upstream end in terms of existing. Um, my sewer main and is there anything about the nature of the river or the flow of the river there that makes that sort of short access at that end of the park less there, feasible than at the down at the other end? Okay. So and obviously we could get into the Grand Island. There is a shoaling area right in the middle of the of the, of the, the park. Um, uh, right in front of the bulkhead is a little shallower than it is on the far upstream end and then on the on the on the downstream end so yeah putting any in water infrastructure didn't really obviously make sense there because the, we don't no one wants to add dredging to another maintenance item to the to the to the city so yeah we were very judicious in which way it made sense to thing it's a little bit the water depths maybe the deepest part would be um uh on the upstream side and just based on the the, the bathymetric survey that was taken um, but it's fairly commensurate what's happening on the east, and so so we're trying to 
again, we were trying to look at all these variations and, and what's been also programmed into the park as part of the overall master plan. So you did ask it. Another thing that was the vision is the master plan was been done for the park. And so we also took that into consideration, too, and what's what could happen in the future, too. So as not to, to, yeah, to, a, to lose those opportunities, either. To a layperson, it seems intuitive that hardened infrastructure on the upstream side potentially has some protective um, effect on softer infrastructure on the downstream side. Maybe that's just a you know. It's you know, it's you know, about, a layman looking at it, looking from overhead would think that, but yeah. it just simply current wise on the river, it's pretty the cross sections of the river are pretty balanced other than the shoal area. So when it's high flood event, it's going to be pretty much the same flow. Um, what you'll see is actually the other side would have a variation because it's so wooded and so treed. There's where you kind of get a retardation of flow because of all the, the you know the vegetation, right? Whereas the bulkhead side, it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hardened edge, so it has a very I hate to be an engineer low friction area. So there's a lot of wa water can pass a lot faster in that in that corridor. So it doesn't make a difference from upstream to downstream in general in this area. Low water would be a different story. Thank you. Just some comments. First of all, I, I have been absolutely blown away by these designs and uh, the ingenuity and imagination and creativity that went into them. Uh, one thing that is just particularly compelling about B is the way that you took the best of both worlds. You have that western end that keeps that sort of traditional bulkhead um, for those who, who, who like that with the overlook, but then on the eastern side, boom, we've got uh, wetlands, we've got terraces, we've got boardwalks. It, I am, as everyone knows, a huge fan of our town common. I run there, I go to the concerts, I do yoga there, I absolutely love our town common. I will say this about the beloved town common, that esplanade just is, just has no imagination to it. It is a sidewalk and a rail and a brick wall. And I think one, and, and you go there, and one of the things I think our city has missed is that you don't have the feeling of being in a river. Hmm. You have a feeling of being, I don't know, in a hallway or something. And one of the things that is just really tremendous about that concept B is that it brings the river back to the town common. It will allow people to have that experience of being at a river. And in all the, you know, the great cities where a river runs through it. You have those places like that where you're able to get down and, and have the river. Did somebody say Paris? <laughs> you can be part of the river, and I think that's one thing that's been sorely missing, and I just am delighted. I'm overwhelmed to see, you know, wetlands and a boardwalk where you have that feeling of the river is now back part of our city, and we can be part of the river, and the river can be part of our city. So I thought that was just, just a tremendous... Um, vision and uh, creativity that, that brought that to these plans while still retaining at the western end, you know, that sort of traditional bulkhead, especially since there's a sewer main over there and um, elevated, you want to look out from 15, 20 feet, you can do that, but then at the eastern end, wow, we got the river. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. So, as I said before, um, we are looking for uh, action uh, this evening to move forward on the project. Um, we'd like to, you know, have council give us direction on a preferred uh, concept. And then the next steps would be come back with task order two, which would be a full construction uh, document uh, permitting phase of the project uh, to your June meeting. Are you looking for a motion? We need, um, we need to know the consensus of the council about whether or not you want to go with option A or B. I would just very strongly support option B. Mm -hmm. Do you like that too? Yeah, I do. I, the first time. I, do. I do think I it's I, feel, um, I, I think it's important to keep in mind. I mean, I like option B too, but we've had alternative. Um, there are other opportunities that we have down at that end of the um, park to create a, you know, something you know that was you know infrastructure that was um that might be a public private partnership that would be a uh you know some sort of park-like amenity that doesn't have to be operated by the city i don't know that the the, 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 the scale of what's proposed there to some extent you know would would substantially reduce those 
there's opportunities. Uh, option B does not preclude development of right. that. Um, so that parcel okay. remains. You're not talking about pulling the river far enough up into that parcel. Actually, actually, I think. Actually, I think B would actually prepare the site even more okay. for a future development. Indeed. Of, of, what kind? Uh, of what kind? Well, it's not just small. And I don't think I don't think the development. I think that the the development and the use of that lot is really not necessarily part of this discussion. Okay. This discussion is: Do you, we want to move with option A or B? And both A and B preserve the developable lot. Right. Yeah, that was my it's question. An important point. I'm, I'm not sure when um, this part of the discussion comes up, or if it's appropriate now. But I think that we're really missing the boat if we, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> if we just go with 150 feet of dock space. I, I, I shared the survey and had an overwhelming amount of feedback. Uh, almost every comment that was made was, you know, please include boat docks. You can, on, especially on mobile, you could barely tell boat docks were included. Um, and then on top of that, you know, I just we see a lot of traffic leave Greenville every day during the summer and spring and fall and go down to Washington and spend money and enjoy that community. When everybody was coming and saying we would rather spend our money here and enjoy that here in Greenville, uh, I saw the mayor shared it, and a lot of the same feedback was on there. He's much more popular on social media than I am, so he got even more feedback. Uh, but I really think that 150 feet is missing the boat. So. And where was that? That was the plan B, though. Both of them. Both of them. He's saying he wants more, like 500, 700 feet. Yeah. Right. So That's what I hear from Council Member Bell yes. is I hear from the bulk of the council. I haven't heard from. Um, Councilmember Robinson or uh, Mayor Pertum, but I hear uh, some sort of coalescing around B with the idea that we um, need to look at the amount of boat dock that's available. And much of this, I'm going to just say, much of this is based on budget availability. Let's, we're, we're designing, we have funds for the design, we have to begin to develop a plan for paying for it that may um, take a, a series of options and funding options related to it. At this point, it's just, we're working on the design, but I hear coalescing around B, and I'm gonna look at Councilmember Robinson. You look at me, when I come late, I don't need to speak first. I need okay. to speak last. I come <laughs> last. Could, we, could we add the additional dog space later? Yeah, these are you are in the conceptual phase. Right. So and, and so I, I don't wanna I don't wanna over I don't wanna get out there and engineer again what I what I think we need enough information so we can move forward with task order two so that engineers can begin to design. And we're not gonna be we're not gonna be at this point be able to answer every single question about it, but I do hear Co coalescing around concept B with the idea of some additional expansion of the boat, of, of a boat, facilities, boat jobs. Mm -hmm. Consensus on B? And neither of those designs limit the ability to, to add dockage? No, it really just becomes a uh, focus where we want to we'll look at water depth, right? Yeah. I mean, so it's really a placement and key to that. Yep. But uh, you know, they're both flexible in that, okay. in that regard. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Dane, what do you think? B. She came first and spoke first. <laughs> so yeah, that's what B seems good to me. So. Yeah, okay. 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 So that's what we need. What we will do at this point is we'll take the concept B, we'll work on, on another task order that will begin the design, and you will see that on your June fifth agenda. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So we have one more presentation. This is really for information purposes only. Don Octagon is going to give us, give us an update on the design for the Dream Park Community Bill. All right. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem Glover, members of Council. Um, I just want to give a brief update on uh, where we are with the Dream Park Community Building from a design perspective. Uh, just as a reminder, the uh, Dream Park uh, Community Building was the old fire station uh, building. It's approximately 5,500 square feet in size. Located at 1700 Chestnut Street, adjacent to Dream Park, uh, right beside our, our spray ground. Uh, it's built in the 1930s, and the city has not used this. Uh, Greenville Fire Rescue has not used it for 40 years, um, the location. So tonight, or this afternoon, I'm going to go over the floor plan. Uh, I'll, I'll zoom in on some of these areas here soon. But overall, the floor plan includes a lobby and office space to accommodate two employees, one full-time and one part-time. That full-time staff, we would look to uh, move that uh, employee from another location. Uh, storage for facility table and chairs to be used for public events and rentals. Uh, warming area 
uh, with refrigerator sink and counter space and two restrooms and one family restroom. It sounds very similar to the Barnes Ebram Taft building, which is located at Greenfield Terrace. And our plan is to manage this, this facility uh, just like we do BET at Greenfield Terrace. Uh, here's a zoomed in version of the lobby and office area. Again, it includes a lobby with a reception desk for staff. Uh, this will be uh, staffed every time there's a rental or, or a program going on. Uh, staff well, office was um, is situated in the corner there to provide a view of the park for increased supervision of the Dream Park and the spray ground. Uh, there's a south facing assembly hall, which I'll go over in a few minutes. Um, also, there's windows along the southwest facade for public entryway, which will be the main entrance uh, for the building. Uh, has expanded assembly area with two overhead doors, uh, which we'll review in a, in a few minutes as well. So the area, the assembly area will accommodate 150 people. Again, this is very similar to uh, BET at uh, Greenfield Terrace. So, uh, we will host uh, family occasions, celebrations that uh, the, the city, uh, the residents can rent the building for. Uh, well, recreation and park staff will also organize youth and adults recreation and enrichment programming to include but not limited to art and music classes, team game nights, adult bingo and card games. Uh, it also provides staff to offer educational opportunities which include wellness and health classes. Plus we will utilize the building for staff trainings for summer camps and CPR. Uh, this is just another assembly area uh, potential furniture layout. Most of the furniture we have at the, si at the center uh, will be available for the public and provided by Recreation Park staff. However, if, if a resident needs other needs, um, they will be able to rent it out uh, from a third party. Uh, this is the assembly area looking out towards Chestnut Street. Uh, so this will be looking from the, warming, the kitchen warming area and the restroom area looking out. Uh, you see the two overhead doors there and the, uh, the central entrance. Uh, this view is uh, South Patio. Uh, the South Patio is facing Chestnut Street. Again, it shows the overhead doors plus the uh, the middle entrance area. This is the current elevation view. I uh, just shows outlined in, in red what would be changing um, of that south patio. Also includes an additional uh, sidewalk, which is uh, also seen in, in red there. Uh, this is the north patio, which faces Myrtle Street, uh, highlighted in red here. Also, uh, this this north patio will get two additional windows plus a new entryway, uh, which will lead into the lobby area. And this is the elevation layout of the north patio. Again, these are all conceptual designs. Um, our next step is to uh, confirm these designs with the uh, HH architecture and move forward with further uh, moving forward to document, uh, construction documents. Which brings me to our project timeline. Uh, so this fall, we, we hope to conclude the 95% design documents um, and then issue construction bids or advertise construction bids in December 2023. Uh, construction will begin uh, with all goes to plan spring 2024 with a completion date of winter 2025 meaning that january february date uh, be finished um, with the spring opening uh, 2025 and that's just a brief overview of where we are be glad to answer any questions i have a question what does parking look like over there uh, so the parking based on the 150 uh, uh, combination for the assembly room uh, we would not have to add any parking uh, we are adding street parking um, but the, the, there's two parking lots right there that will be improved, um, and those will, will be, uh, be able to accommodate the size that we're posting. Thank you. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. As far as staff, would staff be there? Would there be a staff member there all the time, or just when there are events? So that, that's to be determined. Both times, it's, it's, they're going to be there, um, especially during events and also during rentals. So at BT right now, if there's a rental there, we have a part-time staff that's on site uh, because of the size and, and the service we provide for that building. Um, but there will be full-time staff there who will be responsible for organizing the events that I mentioned. Okay. And programs. Yeah, it looks yes. really nice. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How, ma how many uh, square feet are we adding to it? So it still remain the full for, uh, the footprint will still remain 5,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. So they, are you going to have office spaces and all that? So the office space. Let me go back here. So the office space, uh, see, so the assembly area will be approximately 1,800 square feet. Mm -hmm. So 1,800 at 5,500 square feet will be assembly area where uh, families can use it. Um, and then the rest of the building will be the office, uh, electrical, mechanical, um, storage, warming kitchen, and, and, and restrooms. So what the design team has done is taken the current floor plant uh, floor uh, print um, and created this design which be best fits what we want to use for the building floor. Also helps us with the uh, supervision of uh, Dream Park and make sure um, our staff there can keep out on the parking wheel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ask a question. 
Yes, sir. Don, will it be wired for like TV or any, if you want to show videos or something? Yes, sir. Through design. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Through design, we'll have um, for presentation purposes. We'll have a um, still haven't quite fine tuned that yet, but there will be a couple locations where TVs can be can be installed similar to what you see here in this room. Okay. And Mr. Hall, you have a building particularly at the building the park took up a lot of this space now how much space would be for um say someone want to have a family cookout or something like that so if they want to have a family <laughs> if they want to have a family cookout they could um again they would probably accommodate about 150 people or less in the assembly room but also they could they could also use that the park itself too in the playground mm -hmm. um so they could park they could use the patio areas the patio areas are not included in the 5,500 square feet, mm -hmm. so they could they could use. And what uh, what uh, residents do at BT, they open up the overhead doors and they kind of overflow the patio area, which accommodates more more individuals. And those overhead doors have worked really well oh, at BT. They yes. really have worked really well mm -hmm. because they allow somebody to use both inside and outside. Right. Yep. That's me. Okay. We get a lot of great feedback from. Yeah, I like that too. Okay, that, this per presentation was just for information purposes. We'll move forward with the design. We'll hopefully bring, um, as Don had indicated, a con uh, construction contract to you. This is one of the projects that is funded with the ARPA dollars. Mm -hmm. So this project has to be under contract by the end of 2024 and be completed at the end of 2026. Can you get ready for 2023? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday. Can you get it ready? Right? Yesterday. Yesterday. 2030. Mayor Pro Tem, that's all we have for the workshop tonight. Okay. We can adjourn the meeting and everybody can take a break and we'll be back Second. in a second. Oh, that baby was talking. Wow. That's happening. Two, one, go.